This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Thank you, Beasley. Here we are, 10 days from the trade deadline for 2017, and the Flames are, well, interesting to say the least. Matt, how did you enjoy the bye week in our break last week? Well, it was nice to see the Flames head into the bye week on a win, uh, beating the Pittsburgh Penguins, and not so good on the first game back, but I think pretty much every team in the NHL has lost on their return, so not entirely unexpected. and. Yeah, uh, good overall for this week. Well, let's take a look at those games. So before the bye week, the last game after you and I chatted last was the Calgary Flames taking on the Pittsburgh Penguins. And this was a game that I think we were all kind of worried about because the Pens know what they're doing and the Flames can't seem to put things together this year. Um, Looking at this one, I thought the big shining piece for the flames was chad johnson he made 31 saves he looked really good in this game uh michael furlan and Froelich tallied and versteeg buried the shootout winner but i thought that versteeg just had an awesome game all the way around we've seen him sort of be on hot streaks and then i wouldn't even say cold streaks but just sort of looking like a guy who's in the bottom six and this was one where versteeg really looked like the player that he used to be to me i agree and it- Credit to him, he's been on a bit of a roll all through the week, and has his play has elevated quite a bit lately. You'd almost think the man wanted another contract or something. Yeah, almost as if you know what he's doing on the ice actually matters. Um, I also thought in this one that the Penguins, especially in the second period, really dominated the Flames. You could tell that the Flames were being outworked, but I thought the Flames were the team that made the better. Um, they made. They made the most of their chances. Let's put it that way. I thought the Flames, when they got a shot on, they put on net. They had, you know, not necessarily the better chances, but they just made better opportunities with their chances, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that it all started with that turnover by Crosby, allowing Furlan to streak in on the breakaway for the first goal. And then the Flames capitalizing again a couple minutes later. Calgary was very opportunistic in that game, and it was good to see. Unfortunately, they allowed them to come back into the game late, but, you know, surrendering a loser point to Pittsburgh doesn't really matter to us. No, and I think it was more of a morale or momentum thing just to, you know, go into the break strong, but you're right. I mean, you could surrender the points to Pittsburgh, and it doesn't really matter. The Flames then took their one-week break, their five days break, and on the 13th, they came back in a game that should have been, you would think, an easy game looking at the standings. And the Flames got blanked by the Arizona Coyotes, 5 nothing. This was painful to watch. Oh, yeah. That was probably the worst game of the season. And even though Calgary outshot the Coyotes heavily in the first period, it did not look like they were having anything going their way. And like once Arizona took the lead, uh, you could kind of already see that the wheels were going to come off and boy, did they ever. Yeah. The flames ended up out shooting the coyotes 36, 32. I think sort of the opposite of the game before with the flames is the coyotes had, I thought better quality shots in this one. I don't think there's necessarily a goaltending issue for the Flames, even though both goaltenders played in this one. I thought that it was just the whole team, I don't know, looking like they were coming off a break. Oh, for sure. They just didn't look and like they were into it. They weren't quite up to speed yet. No, and you could see that the Coyotes were skating all around them and just they controlled the play entirely, and Calgary had no answer at all. And... The end result was a five nothing final, which you know I mean, where it's we don't really care about dropping points the Coyotes, but we need to be winning against Western Conference teams. 
Oh, for sure. Like, every point matters from here on out. And, like, the Flames currently are in the second wild card spot and have the... Like, if the LA Kings win out, uh, the their games in hand will be tied with them. So, each point in the, this upcoming 23 games, or, yeah, 23 games, is going to be extremely important for the Flames moving forward. You know, I don't know what it is, but the Flames over this year and last year really seem to be struggling quite heavily when they play against Arizona. Well, they won the first four meetings this year against them. This year them. they did, but they weren't all great games. I mean, they oh, won. No. But... Oh, no. Well, can you even remember the last time there was an exciting Arizona-Calgary game? Well, I can't. Like, to me, it, it doesn't have to be an exciting game to be a good game. True, but usually, like, Dave Tippett's ga- teams, like, man, are the games boring. And they just lull you to sleep. Like, even when the Flames won the first four games, none of them were particularly comfortable games, and each one was just kind of a boring, frustrating game to watch. I mean, you could go the opposite way. Let's say that this score was the exact opposite, and it was the Coyotes coming off a break, and we lit them up 5 nothing. It wouldn't have been an exciting game just because of play style, but it would have been a fun game for Flames fans. True. But I know last year we struggled with the Coyotes quite a bit, too. Yeah. Well, let's get move on from that game. The next one was the Philadelphia Flyers, a team that we don't see a whole lot of here in Calgary. Um, and this was a another interesting game, I thought. We don't see the Flyers a lot. I wasn't really sure what to expect of them. I don't know about you. When I think Flyers, I still think of the, uh, you know, the bullies from the 80s. But I thought... You know, even though the the Flames end up winning this one, I didn't think they necessarily should have won. Um, but Brian Elliott had a great game. Um, he really, I think, got the Flames the win and an excellent penalty kill, which is something that we weren't saying at the beginning of this season was what was the key for the Flames to win, in my mind, in this one. I agree. And the Flames were outshot 34-23. Uh, the Flyers won 55% of the face-offs. Calgary had 26 penalty minutes. Like, everything was lining up where... Like, uh, the Flames had 12 giveaways to the Flyers' four. Like, everything was lining up for a Flyers win, but uh, Brian Elliott had one of his best games of the season, and sometimes that's all that matters. And I don't want to say that the Flames didn't play well, but I think that they were just obviously playing against a a better team or a team that was playing better hockey, at least. Yeah, well... I mean, in the standings, Philadelphia is not a better team, but... Yeah, I I think the Flames were still in the post-break hangover. Like, they didn't look ready to play at any point in that game. Like, uh, they they seemed to be reacting to the play instead of driving the play. They did, and I thought that all night they seemed out of sync. They just, they seemed off, their timing was off, they just didn't seem to be playing as a team the way we usually see them doing. Yeah. Yeah. And the Flyers are a very unusually constructed team where, like, their best players are all pretty good, and then, like, there's nothing else. And it just must be frustrating for Flyers fans when you see some of their third and fourth line guys and their depth defensemen being, like, not even NHL caliber players. Especially because, like, they're only two points out of a playoff spot right now, and... Like, if they had a little bit more depth, I think they would actually be a playoff team. But it's just for whatever reason, they're not getting the proper pipeline of young players to come in to actually earn spots and contribute in a proper manner. I thought in this game, too, the Flames did way too much shot blocking. I mean, we have 20, 25 shot blocks that look like a game from last year. And to me, when you're blocking that many shots, it means that you're giving up quality offensive zone puck time to the other team. And that's something that we want to be avoiding. And, you know, credit to Galutz and his system has limited that significantly this year. And the Flames haven't been forced to do that kind of a thing too often this year. Well, he said that to us when we talked to him at training camp, that, you know what, if they're blocking shots, it means that 
something's got away from you and that's your last resort. Yeah. And it it is what it is and just thankfully the Flames skated away with the two points that they desperately needed. Interesting defensive pairing we saw for, I think it was almost all of this game, was uh, Giordano and England together. Yeah. What'd you think of that pairing? Doesn't hurt to see if you can get England, utilize him more. Uh, He's always been one of those guys that you can put in spots where like it seems like he's above his pay grade but he does rise to the occasion so i didn't think he looked particularly bad in that game it, there was nothing wrong with his play so i don't think that'll continue moving no. forward especially with today's news but it's it just was, nice to see it was an interesting experiment yep doesn't hurt and in the last game of the week, the Calgary Flames took on our rivals, the Vancouver Canucks. We had one new face in the lineup, which was Matt Bartowski on the blue line. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a bit. And the Flames couldn't get this one done, losing out to Vancouver 2-1 uh, to one in overtime. Yeah, and this one was the first game after the break that they actually played like they should be. And... Uh, you just have to give Ryan Miller credit, just like Elliot in the Flyers game. Miller just stood on his head, and if it wasn't for that knuckle puck goal by England or Edler, then uh, the Flames may have actually skated away with two points. But we've seen Miller bail this team out a few times this year. Well, the, honestly, the only reason why Vancouver's not with Arizona and Colorado is largely due to ryan miller uh, that team is not very good not very deep like they only have 142 goals this season and you know to arizona's 137 so like and they've played three more games than arizona so you know overall crazy. you know like that team is not very well constructed and like for them to even be within four points of a playoff spot is a minor miracle considering they have a minus 30 goal differential. The thing that's crazy to me is the Canucks got 19 shots all game. Like that's usually what you end up with after a good period. Oh, I know. And Vancouver is not, they do, just don't have any offensive weapons. And that that's part of the reason why Grandland and Berchi are having such a good season this year is that, they don't have anybody else and like neither one of those players are legitimate top six forwards but on vancouver they're kind of forced to be so you know eh, it is what it is yeah you see that from time to time with teams though yeah so before we talk about some of the acquisitions that the flames have made matt i wanted to uh kind of i don't know go on a bit of a rant here but this team's really frustrating this year there's been a lot of games that they have been terrible in and they've rightfully lost those games but there's other games where they've been dominant and they still lose either because their scorers can't score because the goalies can't stop the puck or a lot of times just because this club seems to take way too many penalties we won't get into the weidman gate of factoring that um but the the thing about this team if you look at it is none of these problems are supposed to be problems i mean we switched out our entire goaltending team both at the ahl and and nhl level everyone except for um gillies uh, everyone except for gillies is new um calgary was the one of the least penalized teams last year and true living spent a lot of time in the summer to address these problems uh, the goaltending should have been improved. We brought in Brower. We have two top players on new contracts. And really, if you look at it, it's it's a minor miracle that we're within... Right now, we're sitting in a playoff spot, but we're that close to where we are. When we've seen points this year where this team has looked bad, it just looked like the wheels fell off. So, I don't know, with 10 days left before the trade deadline, I'm I'm just frustrated by this team because we're not sure what we're going to get. Things still look shaky. The blue line is still top heavy. The UFAs haven't worked out. Our top players aren't doing their job. But just we saw this last year, and you and I have talked about this a little bit with, you know, last year it was the the top players doing everything, 
and the bottom guy is not contributing. Now it looks almost like the top guys are nothing and the bottom guys are doing all the contributions. So what's it going to take to right this wagon? This is why I very rarely give management in any team a hard time. Treliving did everything that humanly possible, given the cap situation, to address the team's needs. His and, job is on paper to give us a good, balanced team. And he, d y you he did. look at his uh, everything that he's done, and yeah, that those were smart, prudent moves. Can't argue. Nobody expected Gaudreau to have the season he's having, and you can just go down the line of all the players that are struggling. But on the bright side, even though everything has been frustrating this year, and a lot of things have not gone right, and the team's been in very inconsistent, we're in a playoff spot with 23 games left to go. And if any of these problems start correcting themselves, like say Brian Elliott plays like Brian Elliott, then the Flames will be in the playoffs again, and then it's uh who knows how, who we're going to be facing. It'll probably be Minnesota or San Jose. And, you know, you just see how those games go. And, uh, you know, like, yeah, you'd ideally hope that the team would be better and everybody firing on all cylinders, but sometimes life happens and... Like, nobody expected Gaudreau to go from being one of the best players in the NHL to a guy that's struggling on a nightly basis. And So I guess the question then becomes if, and you've mentioned this and I've mentioned this, we both think that we're a year or two away from being serious contenders, what do we have to do to make sure we're getting the best out of all our assets? I mean, True Living's putting them on the ice, but what's where's that disconnect? Well, the one main problem, and I've mentioned this before, is having too much cap tied into players that just are not worth the cap that they're being paid. And a prime candidate that I think every Flames fan can agree is Dennis Weidman and his $5 million. If Dennis Weidman was performing as a $5 million player, there'd be absolutely no problem. But... It, it, once his deal's gone and like if they reallocate that five million dollars towards a legitimate top six forward then it makes sense and like now you have another legitimate weapon to deploy offensively which takes a lot of pressure off a guy like Gaudreau if he's not having a great night maybe the other guy will be having a good night. And but at the same time, we spent a lot of money on a top six forward this year in Troy Brower and have been nothing but disappointed. Well, I think that was more expectations of what Brower is. And to me, like Brower always was more of a decent third-line guy who can chip in 20 goals, basically replacing a guy like Curtis Glencross, what he brought to the team. Obviously, they're not the same player at all, but that generic role of being a solid top-nine forward that has a ton of playoff experience, has won a cup, and knows what it... it means to win and how to do it and he's had a frustrating season but he's only five points off of his pace from a year ago so like even though he's had a bad season for himself he's not out of line with his career norms and a lot of people didn't like Michael Froelich last year and now they like him a lot uh, just because he was having a hard time last year and, like, I wouldn't be shocked if next year Brower has a resurgence like he did, like Froelich did. And, because you also have to remember the line that's that Brower's been on. Like, he's ha had guys like Versteeg and Bennett, who's been struggling. And, like, he, he hasn't had the same type of line mates that he did in Washington. So, Brower and St. Louis? Well, yeah, he played with Bacchus, didn't he, in St. Louis? I think so, yeah. 
So you could be right. I guess it's just to me, it's like, okay, we can see sort of the end of the tunnel. We've made some predictions for UFAs, but what happens if we keep bringing these guys in? They just keep underperforming here. And this team just keeps being this sort of mess of pieces. And like, what do we change next? We've changed the coach. We've, you know, we've changed the GM, if you will, bringing in um, Trilliving a few years ago. Like, it, to me, it seems like we can't change much more. Well, that's the key there, is that the Flames don't have a lot of things that they need changing. And, like, getting uh, Michael Stone today, like, especially if they retain him into next season, then, like, that, that you're, you now have a legitimate top four defense, and then you get one more right winger ideally and your top nine forwards are set and then it's just a matter of figuring out the remaining parts like there's not really that many things that the flames need to address it's just they desperately need to address them that's the thing like it's not like you've got a uh yuri hoodler who's just doing okay like they they've got Alex Chase on instead. Like it, there's. So you're just thinking golf. that when we shed money, we can go out and go shopping this summer and get what we need, and that'll solve everything. That'll solve. It won't solve everything, but it'll solve a good portion of it. And like ideally, the Flames will get another good prospect or two in the draft, and like you'll start seeing some graduations of some young players, but. It's just one of those things that the you just have to be patient and see exactly like what the flames needs are moving forward and carry on from there and that will reveal itself like especially next year I'm expecting the team to be better cuz they'll be able to spend some money to fix some problems but then you can start to see okay well now this part which was kind of okay is not so then the following season you can make further refinements but the flames are getting to the point where they should be a legitimate playoff contender all season every year and you know like teams like anaheim and uh, san jose are on the downswing so not right now but will be soon so hopefully that that will open up some room for the flames and unfortunately the oilers to be the top teams in our division for the next handful of years well let's hope so because i mean i don't know what it's going to take but we need johnny we need sean we need our top guys to bounce back and yeah we definitely need some supporting pieces still to go in there but whatever it is we need to do to get those guys motivated, we've got to go do that thing. Whether that's, you know, give them a rest over the summer, whether that's put them together. Like, I don't know what it is that they need, but. Well, I all... think Gaudreau for sure needs to get with the program in terms of diet and exercise, but that's another whole conversation. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure the team's working on that too. Well, Matt, let's, you mentioned Michael Stone. Let's talk about the Flames' two recent acquisitions. We're 10 days out from trade deadline as we record this on the 20th of February, and the Flames have got an early jump on this, bringing in two defensemen since we recorded last. The first one was an, a sort of an odd signing. The Flames signed Matt Bartowski, who's been playing in the AHL this year, to a part-time tryout agreement on the 15th of February, and just a few days later signed him to a full two-year, two-way deal at 613 thousand dollars per year he's still in calgary he played the vancouver game wearing jersey number 44 and an interesting note for those that don't know bartowski was originally said to be one of the pieces that was supposed to come back calgary's way if we would have done the jerome again deal to boston so we get that piece anyways but um Trilliving talked about this guy he originally said they wanted to sign him to a pto the pto was two weeks long people thought they'd just wait till after the deadline and signed him to a full t- to a full time contract then, but uh, they said they wanted to have a good look at him. He helps them with some veteran depth in Stockton. They admitted that they have a lot of very young defensemen in Stockton, and they need um, you know some veteran players. And we've seen that in the past. They had Aaron Johnson down there last year and guys like that. Um, 
But really, I think that this is having, and they've admitted it, this was also an entry draft move. This gives us one more, or sorry, expansion draft move. There's one more guy that we can leave unprotected in the expansion draft. So, Matt, your thoughts on the Bartowski signing? Well, it doesn't hurt. And like especially with signing him right away, if the Flames say they lose every game between now and the de- trade deadline, not likely going to happen, but you never know. If they leave eight points on the table, they're screwed. Yeah, and it, that's the thing. It, it gives you options, like if the Flames do decide to sell, that you could, like, say the Flames want to trade Dennis Weidman, right? Well, at least they have an actual NHL-caliber defenseman that can hold the fort. Now... Bartkowski is a step down from everybody else other than Yoki Paka and Kulak. And I think he's basically in that same generic area as those guys. It doesn't hurt. He's not going to blow you away being super amazing awesome. He's just there. A, a, num- a regular number 6-7 guy. He you know, feels- and you're saying at least we have an NHL caliber guy, but to me, if you're going to trade it, let's say we do find a buyer for Weidman, this is where you want to bring up the young guys to see what you've got there. I would much rather give a, an Oliver Shillington ice time than a, Mart- than a Matt Bartkowski. Well, it's also one of those if the Flames want to still remain competitive to the playoffs as well. So, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's... Veter- yeah, but even- you know, like a, a veteran guy is always a little bit better. Like, especially like say the Flames did lose out until the deadline, they would still be in striking distance of pushing for a playoff spot. So you're not gonna want to risk throwing a kid in there and like ruining your season and possibly ruining the player just because oh he's young. So it's one of those deals that. It doesn't hurt the team. It won't significantly help the team. It's he's just there. Could be worse. Uh, could be better. Well, I can under, you know, and I think that as a, a sort of an AHL signing, it makes sense. Bring him in, make him the veteran guy in the A. But I'm surprised that they brought him in and and put him in an NHL game right away. I kind of expect him to be immediately sent to the AHL. Well, to be fair, in the Vancouver game, he actually looked pretty good and nearly scored a goal. So. You know, see how he does and, you know, play him the next game. If he looks better than Yoki Paka, keep him in. Leave Yoki Paka on the sidelines. And and if nothing else, like you mentioned with Yoki Paka, it's one more option. I mean, Yoki Paka's contract's up at the end of this year. Weidman's contract's up. England's contract's up. So I have no doubt that Bartkowski starts the year in the A next year, but it gives us that, like you said, that veteran guy when you need a veteran guy, that guy you can pull up to play two, three games. Flames have been fortunate this year. They haven't really had a lot of long-term injury, especially on the blue line. But he would definitely be that sort of veteran call-up guy. Yeah, and even if you left Barkowski as the number seven next year, he's making the league minimum, so it's not really going to impact the cap too much either. So That's true. It's one of those, meh, I guess it works. Who cares? You know, it's not going to make or break the Flames season either way. It's interesting to see moves like this being made. And I mean, the GM admitting they're being made really just for the expansion draft. And it's it's having a weird effect on everything this year. And I think that'll continue right through the deadline. Yeah, well, we can see that in the trade that we made today. Well, let's talk about that one. So the trade, I'm actually really excited about this. The Calgary Flames acquired Michael Stone. He's a, a defenseman, right defenseman, from the Arizona Coyotes in exchange for a third-round draft pick in 2017 and a conditional fifth-round draft pick in 2018. The condition kicks in if Stone re-signs with the Flames because he's a free agent at the end of the year. And in this case, the Arizona Coyotes will retain half of Stone's salary. So that means they'll be paying $2 million and the Flames will be paying $2 million. For those that don't know Michael Stone, let's talk about him a little bit. He wears number 26 in Anaheim, He'll or in, sorry, Arizona. He'll obviously have to change that no, when he gets here. He's- He's keeping number 26. Oh, is he? Okay. Yeah. Wotherspoon's going to have to change. There you go. Makes sense. 
Um, he's born June 7th, 1990 in Winnipeg. He's a six foot three, 191 centimeters. He weighs 210 pounds, a right shot defenseman, which we've needed. He's 26 years old. He was drafted in the third round by Arizona in 2008. So really, if you look at it, I love it when you make a trade for a guy and you pretty much, you know, get what they're worth. He was a third round pick and we gave up a third to get him. No. Yeah. Arguably on a sort of rich deal for where he is in his career at $4 million, but, you know, for the Flames bringing him in at $2 million, I have no doubt if they want to bring him back, they will. And it, Yeah, and he, with him having a bit of a down season this year, I, he won't be making $4 million, but, you know, even if he's replacing uh, Derek England next year it, at his value at $3 million, like, that would not be a bad re-sign if the Flames I, do go that route. Yeah, I mean, England comes off at three. Smeed comes off at three, five. He's definitely better than Smeed. Yeah, and like if you figure like a Stone and England are somewhat similar in terms of the style of play. Stone obviously has a lot more offensive ability. So like if you're swapping those two guys out for one another, you're basically changing a 35-year-old, soon to be 35-year-old for a 26-year-old. So it fits more in line with the Flames team moving forward and like I have no doubt like if the Flames wanted to sign him right away, they could and just say like give uh, Vegas like a 7th round pick if you don't take Michael Stone and just leave him unprotected. So that's also a feasibility. For those that say, I recognize that name, you may. From 2006 through 2010, Michael Stone was here playing for the Hitmen. And he played, uh, he was notable for his four games in the Memorial Cup run the Flames went on in 2010, um, the playoffs there. And, you know, he looked good. Um, good, good kid. I really like him as a player. He's still young, as you mentioned, and last year as a defenseman, he had 36 points, 30 assists, 6 goals. This year he has 1 goal, 8 assists for 9 points, but he's also playing on a terrible team. And I think that this is really, this is sort of a Brian Burke type player to me. He's truculent, he's offensive, and he's young. Not offensive, but you know what I mean? He's he's an offensive defenseman. Um, and he's, he I think he'll fit in really well here in Calgary. Yeah, I have no doubt, and I'm just hoping that his knee injury from last season, like if the Flames do retain him moving forward, that it gets better so that way he can be more of the 36-point guy instead of the 9-point guy, but we'll see. He looks, I don't know, from what I've seen of him this year, he looks okay. His knee doesn't look like it's bothering him. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing they'll find out as they play him this year. Yeah. And, you know, worst case scenario, they get an extra, like, from now until July 1st to uh, talk with them and... Run that, the medical that, tests. Y- and... Yeah, and know what he's all about. So, and that in of itself is a, worth the third round pick just because of the fact that, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, like, he was one of the main targets that we were looking at in when it came to signing a UFA. So... Now we get to play him for 23 games and see how he fits. So, Matt, would you agree that we now have a bona fide top four? Yeah, for sure. And what would you, if you were the coach, what would you put as your as your top two pairings now? I think you go Geo Hamilton and Brody Stone, and then you figure out England plus one, whether it's Barkowski, Yoki Paka, or Weidman. I think for this year that definitely works. I think... I would try near the end of the year putting Gio Brody back together just to see what Hamilton and Stone can do. Well, the coaching staff wants left, right, left, right. And with the two pairings, as I mentioned, they are left, right, left, right. So it's true. Um, do you think if you're the Calgary Flames GM, you're still now in the hunt for, say, a Carl Alsner, who we've talked about, or do you feel confident with your top four? Well, I think the Flames are done for acquiring defensemen for this season. For this season, for sure. But on, let's say, would you re-sign Stone, or would you go after Alsner, or try to do both? I would probably just keep Stone, uh, just because he's younger and likely will be cheaper. 
um, just due to his bad season thus far. And, uh, you know, he always kicked the tires, because you never know. But I, I would lean more towards Stone at this point, especially with him being familiar with the team at that point. So... Yeah, I thought Alzner was a good choice, but I think if we've got Stone, he's 26. I don't want Stone, and you know it would be him that would drop. I don't see him being a 5'6 defenseman. Yeah. So I think the Geo Brody, Hamilton, and Stone as your top four D-men, I think that's a really good top four, and then it's easy to fill out the bottom two after that, whether we bring in a UFA or we sign somebody internally. But I think Stone is a... Stone is a really good option there. And the Flames, I mean, if you look at this deal, Matt, we paid nothing for this guy. Oh, no. A third-round pick? whoop de doo like, Especially this year's draft is not very good compared to even last year, which also was not an exceptional draft. So, And, yeah, I, we're giving up a fifth next year, but knowing how the Flames have gone the past couple of years of the deadline, I would not be surprised to see those, quicks, those picks quickly replaced. And honestly, I think if the Flames do decide to move Dennis Weidman at the deadline, you could re possibly recoup one or both of those picks. Not necessarily in the rounds, but like say you get like a fifth and a seventh for Weidman, like I think that's a viable thing. Like you're, yeah, you're trading down a couple rounds, but at that point, you know you're relying on your scouts to find more. Manjapanes and Falkovskis and Phillips type guys. At so. this point, I'm not convinced it's if the Flames want to move them. From what I've been reading and hearing, the Flames want to move them. They just need to find a dance partner. Yeah, and there there are guys that out there that will need a guy like Dennis Weidman. And I keep mentioning Edmonton, and now that Edmonton looks like they will actually make the playoffs, it, you know first time since 2006 <laughs> but uh last yeah. time they made the last time they ran for the cup we ended up having a lockout so well no it was the year after oh, the that lockout. Was, that's right never mind yeah so you know i think that with them having russell there i think a russell weidman pairing there's well, and they're two guys that are familiar with each other. Exactly, nice. and they don't have a slap shot on their team from the blue line, so the Flames just are one of those few lucky teams where we have four guys that can, and now five guys that can fire one-timers from the point, and like it just becomes redundant. Like Usually those are your first power play guys, and... Like Weidman, he's not getting a lot of power play time lately because of the fact that we have so many other options that are better. So if the Oilers wanted to give a fifth or a sixth or something for Weidman, like I'm sure the Flames would be more than willing to eat half of the salary too just to move on. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, sa we're saving money with one contract. We might as well, you know, do the same for somebody else. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, you're you're right. Michael Stone is officially listed on the roster as 26, which I think tells us that Watherspoon's probably on his way out, anyways. Which we've been saying pretty much all year, anyway. We have. So I mean, Matt, if you look now at the defense, we've got a ton of defensemen here: um, Matt Bartowski, T.J. Brody, Derek England, Mark Giordano, Dougie Hamilton, Yerky Okipaka, Brett Kulak, Michael Stone, Dennis Weidman. I think there's no doubt the Flames are trying to move Weidman. If they can't, do you think that this now puts him in the press box? Like, is there any reason to put Dennis Weidman on the ice right now? Not at all. I, I honestly would not even play him at this point. Uh, and, like, that's not a slight to him. It's just that in terms of foot speed, you can't have Englund and Weidman together. Uh, well, that is a slight on him. Like... It, if you had them separate, you could get away with it, but you're not going to displace either Brody or uh, Stone just to placate Weidman, and I'd rather have either Yoki Paka or uh, Bartkowski just because of the fact that they're quicker and less prone to giving up two-on-ones and such because they're slow at the blue line. Kulak is still waiver-exempt, isn't he? Yeah. 
So I will have, I have no doubt. Now, I thought after Bar- Bartkowski, maybe not, but after two new defensemen, I bet the next move we see is Kulak goes back on his way to Stockton. Oh, he's already down there. Is he? Okay, good. So, yeah, that was what I was kind of expecting. So, really, at that point, you're right. It's either going to be Yoki Paka, probably Yoki Paka, but either him or Bartkowski who plays with England. And I think Weidman just, he's played himself out of a job. He's just not fast enough. Yeah. And especially with this being a fast league, like, a, it, you just can't have guys like Weidman that are that slow. Like, honestly, I'm not even sure if Weidman will have a contract next season. Or if he does, it will be a cheaper one by a long shot. Like, as like a $2 million veteran six guy to only, like, put out on the power play and that's it. Yeah, I don't know. I'm um, I'm of the mind that Weidman probably goes to Europe next year if he wants to keep playing. And I wouldn't be shocked if that. Laddie Smead is also listed on the Flames roster. We know that he's not playing this year, so there's another contract that comes off the books at the end of the year. But it's I think that the I'm really excited about the Stone acquisition. I think the Flames have this is one of those deals I love when you can make an acquisition, you can pay next to nothing, sort of like we did with Hamilton. And it's something that's going to help you going forward. And I think by doing it now, ten days out of the deadline, the Flames probably avoided having to pay a lot more for Stone than they would have otherwise. Yep. And plus with uh how uh with the expansion draft looming like there's not going to be too many teams that are going to be wanting to shed high quality assets especially if they're going to lose the player anyway so uh, i'm sure that that helped to depress the return like uh, in a normal year i think stone might get a late first or an early second but calgary just lucked out and hopefully we can keep moving forward well, let's talk about that. So going forward, it's expected that the Flames will be protecting probably three defensemen um, going into the expansion draft. So no no question in my mind, it's Gio Brody Hamilton. Oh, would for you sure. Agree? For sure. So would you try to sign Stone before the end of the season and then incentivize Vegas not to take him? Yes. Or would you rather go to July 1st and then try to re-sign him at that point? I would sign him as soon as possible, and like a a three year, three million per deal, something around that, and say to Vegas, hey, we'll give you say like Emil Poirier or some other draft pick or something of value. Just don't take Stone and take somebody else. And teams are always willing to do that. Like I remember uh, when Minnesota and Columbus came into the NHL, the Sharks traded some draft picks and prospects to each of the teams so they didn't take Evgeny Nabokov. So, you know, it's doable. It's just figuring out exactly what the price Vegas would want. And you got to figure that Vegas is going to have their pick of a bunch of good young players and defensemen from all the teams so like what difference really is it to them if they go one route or the other so we'll see i wouldn't like i would rather them sign stone and lose him in the expansion draft than not sign him and possibly just lose him to free agency well and the nice thing if they do lose him is as we've mentioned last week or a couple weeks ago i think um there's other defensemen out there. You know, if we lose them, we go after Alsner, we go after a few of the other guys. But yeah, I, I would agree with you. And if you look back at what the trades were that were made not to protect players in the past, it's generally been pretty reasonable. So if we go back to the 2000 NHL expansion draft, the San Jose traded Jan Calhoun, a ninth round pick, and a conditional pick to Columbus after they after the Blue Jackets agreed not taking take Nabokov. And Buffalo traded Jean-Luc Grandpierre, Matt Davidson, and two fifth-round picks after the Blue Jackets agreed not to take Hasek or Biron. Um, San Jose traded Andy Sutton and a seventh-round pick and a third-round pick in the 2001 uh, entry draft to Minnesota for an eighth-round pick after the Wild agreed not to take Evgeny Nabokov. So pretty reasonable picks there. I bet you could probably throw a fifth or even a sixth. Maybe if we could do a seventh, I'd be really happy. 
But especially in a weak draft year, I think, you know, if we could move them a lower round pick to keep Stone, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. Um, again, I think we're going to have no intro living. We're going to have a wealth of picks coming back in the next week or so. And so I think we'll have some picks to play with there. But I'm I'm really excited about this this pick, and I hope that they can get Stone signed. I think three would be generous, but reasonable. I think that's probably where both teams would would fall in the middle. Yeah, like I'm sure the Flames would want somewhere around two five, and Stone would probably want around three five. So settle for England money, give or take, and yeah, and and I mean that makes it easy too. You just swap one guy on the roster for another with the same money. Um, we'll talk next next week, Matt, more about the trade deadline, and I'm assuming we may have one or two more trades done before then. But do you think Weidman's really the only defenseman who's at risk right now? Uh, I think that would be it. I don't see the need to trade England. So, I think everyone probably realizes England's going to Vegas, so they know it would be a rental, and I'm I don't know that the value for an England rental is that high. Yeah, and plus if the uh if Vegas signs England, then we won't have to have anybody protected at all in the expansion well, draft. when so. they sign them. True, but hopefully the NHL makes it so that they have to do their business before the expansion draft. Yeah, I don't know. George McPhee's a clever guy. I can see him circumventing that. Um and yeah, who knows? Matt, um, moving from the back end to the front end of the ice, I think that we have an interesting comparison here that I saw on Flames Nation about a week ago, looking at Kachuk's rookie season compared to Monaghan's, Goudreau's, and Bennett's. And, you know, every year it seems like the rookie is doing well. And has Kachuk actually been doing better, or is he just looking better because everyone else is depressed? So interesting numbers on this one. Looking at these guys, this was written on February 12th on... Um, Flames Nation by Ari Yanover. And looking at the players all in their rookie season up to February 12th, Kachuk is the second best of the group. Monaghan had 24 points at that point. Goudreau had 41. Bennett 28 and Kachuk 34. That doesn't surprise me just thinking it through logically. How about you? No, and it's one of those things that, like, I, I know a lot of fans were disappointed by last season but Kachuk may end up being eventually might be one of if not the most important player in the organization so it, yeah it sucked last year to be as bad as the Flames were but on the other hand Kachuk has been full marks and is looking like a budding superstar in his own right, and like the next Brad Marchand, Milan Lucic type player, and he's good at both ends of the ice. So we'll see. Like he's even outpacing his old man, which is surprising considering how good of a career Keith Kachuk had. Yeah, and and I think that's the hard part too. Being a young player whose dad played is you're always being compared to your dad. And in this case, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like you said, he's outpacing his dad. And, you know, I think that's always where that magnifying glass is. Oh, he's not doing as well as his dad. Yeah. But he's he looks like he's doing pretty well. Um, another interesting stat here in this article was looking at each of these players and who they played with for the majority of their rookie season. You tell me who you think got the worst lineup here. Monaghan in his rookie season played primarily with Colborn and Hoodler. Goudreau played primarily with Hoodler and Monaghan. Bennett played primarily with Froelich and Backlund. And this year, Kachuk plays primarily with Froelich and Backlund. I'd have I to say Monaghan clearly had the best or worst of the yeah, group. Yeah, I think so. And, and Goudreau I'd, with the best. Goudreau with the best for sure. So it's interesting looking at those and the time on ice for each of these players. Um, it, quite significantly different. Um, Goudreau shared five on five time with Hoodler. They played 778 minutes together. He and Monahan played 500 minutes together, and that's the most of any of those lines. So Goudreau was definitely put right into that first line role and played with the same line mates for most of the year. And I think for a rookie, that's really important that you have that, you know, 
that line that you can get comfortable with right away. Monahan played about 300 and change minutes with both Colborn and Hoodler. He moved around that year. So definitely, it's interesting to see, too, that Bennett, Froelich, and Backlund played together, and now Kachuk, Froelich, and Backlund played together. It's like Froelich and Backlund play with whoever the new rookie is. But that's a steady line, and I think that, you know, the fact that of those four guys, they're all doing so well in terms of their line mates and their points in the rookie year. We've got some great stars here. Oh, yeah. Um, like, certain players are struggling, like Bennett and, to a lesser extent, Goudreau, but they're also young and having to adapt to the NHL as well. So, like, it took a handful of players like Backlund a number of years to become the player that they were, so or they are now. So, it's one of those situations where... It, the future is very bright for all of those players. It's just having to get through the games to the point where they actually establish themselves as being as good as they are, they could be. Yeah, and and like you said, I think Kachuk has the potential to be one of the most most important players for the Flames, even if not the number one center, maybe the second center. But I think he's going to be a big part of this team. He's going a left forward. winger. But oh, yeah. sorry. Let me do that again. Sorry, you're right. My bad. Matt, I think you're right. I think that looking at these young players, Kachuk definitely has that ability to be a number two left winger. I think it's going to be hard to usurp Goudreau in his, you know, in his role as number one. But I think definitely part of that top, you know, two lines, top six core. And I think that he may I think that he may all, honestly down the road in two, three years force the Flames hand to move Bennett. We'll see. It's a good problem to have. It is. And, you know, we, we've seen for years that the Flames, their cupboards were so bare, everyone said. And now to have, you know, four great young forwards in Monaghan, Goudreau, Bennett, Kachuk, looking at our back end, having Brody, Hamilton, Stone. This team, you know, we're not as bare as we used to be. And even though all those guys weren't Flames prospects, we're getting that infusion of youth onto this team. This is more of a young guns team than the actual young guns teams were. Yeah. And we still have a, a whole host of young guys on Stockton that are getting ever closer to joining the rest of the team up here. So a lot to look forward to. There sure is. Um, Shifting away a little bit from the Calgary Flames on ice product to a little bit of the off ice. We talked before about the what they were calling the Calgary Next Project, the Flames proposed arena project in the West Village that a lot of people didn't like and a lot of people equally liked. It was very controversial. And the city has now come back with what they're calling Plan B. This is a proposal for a new arena complex. The city has committed $150 million to it. And this would be in Victoria Park. So for those that don't know where that is, this is sort of the area between the Stampede Grounds and the East Village. And, um, you know, reading through this, I think it makes sense. The city obviously wants the Flames in that area. They want them downtown. They want them near the Stampede Grounds. They want, I think, the arena available for Stampede stuff. And if you look on a Google map of the Victoria Park District, it's kind of a yucky area. All it really is is surface parking lots. It sort of comes alive for the 10 days of Stampede, and then we shut it down and nothing goes on there for the rest of the year. Um, did you read this proposal, Matt? Not yet, actually. Okay. So based on kind of knowing that area and, and what I've mentioned, what do you think about the proposal? Well, it wouldn't hurt. Like, uh, there's only ex a handful of areas where it makes logistical sense for the team to put the arena. And having it in Victoria Park would make sense. There are a couple other places, but, you know, having it more or less where the current saddle dome is uh, it does make sense it won't really change anything in terms of logistics for traffic Fans or anything there. yeah yeah transit that sort of thing this pitch um this does not have everything in one place which is what the flames had pitched so this pitch envisions a new arena and event center at stampede park the new field house in northwest calgary the place that they haven't named exactly and renovations done to mcmahon and I understand why the Flames is the owner of all these teams like it all in one place, but I kind of like the idea of having those pieces all in different places. I can't imagine being a kid's 
let's say, sports team playing at the field house on a Flames game night. Like, the parking and stuff for parents just be too crazy. I like the idea of the football team being, you know, having their own home. So, from that aspect, I like this. I was never all that fond of everything in one place. Yeah. I can agree with that. And we just have to see exactly what shakes down with it in the coming months. And I'm just hoping that there is some forward momentum with the project, regardless of where they end up sticking it. So that way the Flames can actually get going on building the building. Well, you know, and if nothing else, I think as we're starting to see the sort of the Calgary economy stabilize itself again, not quite, but we're starting to see it swinging up. I can see the city wanting to do this and moving forward on it either way just to to get people employed again. I mean, there's a lot of people that are required to build an arena of this size and this caliber. So I can see them wanting to jumpstart the construction industries and all the thing, all the things that would go along with that. And I really think that the biggest thing we're waiting on is the Olympic bid. And to see where the funding comes from that. But overall, I, I like this area as a Flames fan. I like this positioning better than the West Village. I mean, I, I take transit to all the games. And I think, like you said, it's already hooked into transit. It makes sense there. It's an area we're all familiar with. And it's still close to, you know, the the Red Mile. It's still close to all the downtown amenities. So many people like to go downtown before the games. And the West Village, even though it's sort of downtown, it still kind of feels like that outlying piece of downtown. Yeah, I agree. And it's instead of going eastbound, when you get off the train, you go westbound. Big deal. Yeah, and from, you know, outside of the flames, from a Calgarian perspective, I think it would be nice during the Stampede to have that event center, that place that we can go that's in the same area. Instead of, oh, we got to get on the train and go across downtown to get to the concert tonight or whatever else is going in there. To me, it makes sense to keep it there. I think the big fight the flames are going to have, and I don't know where this is sitting, but the flames, I think, are really mostly trying to get out from under the Stampede board's thumb. And I think that that might be the big fight there of well, who's going to own this land and who's going to maintain this land. Because they've already said that, you know, they hate the parking prices, but they can't do anything about it because they just rent from the stampede. So it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward. Do you have any predictions if it'll be plan A, plan B, or some new plan coming forward? Well, I'm sure that by the time everything rolls out, it'll probably be plan F or G or H. <laughs> Well, I guess as far as location goes, do you think it'll be West Village or uh, Victoria Park? Honestly, uh, I if I was to guess, it would be near where the Saddle Dome currently is, but it would just be a guess. Yeah. It'll be interesting, too, to see if they do decide to reno McMahon and this whole thing, how long that's going to take, because that building needs a lot of reno. Same thing with the dome. That's why they want a new one. So be curious to see how long we might be at a commission if that happens. Because there's really no alternative there for the stamps in the city. No. So, I don't know. We've also got Burns Stadium, where the Cannons used to play right across the street. So maybe that gets worked into it somehow. To me, though, it seems like the ideal place to put the field house. Yeah. We'll see. But we'll see what happens. Yeah. Not so enough Matt, information it... yet to give any definite, oh, that's a good idea or not, so... Well, just looking at the idea on paper, I like the Victoria Park idea better. I like the idea of splitting it all up and putting the flames in the same area. And not having the whole you know new area that has to be built up around it. Just put it into an established area. Well, Matt, let's get to doing our predictions. It's been a while since you and I have predicted. We took a week off. The last time that we predicted was the week of February 6th. And that week we had four games, eight points on the table. That's what we talked about at the beginning of the show, and the Flames skated away with five of the total eight points. Um, you had predicted four, or sorry, you predicted six, and I predicted four, so we were right in the middle, so nobody gets a point on the week. This week is another eight-point week, four games ahead of us, and they're all on the road right up until the trade deadline, well, right up till the day before the trade deadline. So the 21st, the Calgary Flames play in Nashville at 6 p.m. Calgary time. Tampa Bay on the 23rd is a 5.30 p.m. start Calgary time. And the next night, there's a back-to-back with the Florida Panthers, another 5 p.m. start. And then on Sunday the 26th, the Flames end their road trip in Carolina with a 1 p.m. mountain time start. That's their four-game road trip before they come back to play the Kings here the day before the trade deadline. 
Um, tough, could be a tough road trip, could be an easy road trip, depending on how you interpret these four teams. But I think we would both agree that Flames need to pick up some points here. Yeah, and I'm going to once again go with what I feel that they need to get, and that is six points. I feel that they're only going to get four, but uh, they need six. They do. So which six do you think they're going to pick up? Everybody but the Florida Panthers. The so Panthers think... are a lot better now that Barkoff and Huberdo are back. So It's also the second game of back-to-back. And we tend not to do as well. Nobody tends to do as well on those. I'm looking at this week. I think Nashville on the 21st could be a very interesting game. Um, That's another team like us that's desperate for some points right now. And I think these two teams in principle should battle hard for those points. I think the Flames should be able to beat the Predators. I don't think they'll beat Florida. I agree with you. I don't think they'll beat Tampa Bay. There's just something about Tampa Bay where we tend not to play our game. And Carolina's a mixed bag. We've had some good games, some bad games against them, but I'm going to go with four points. I'm going to say that we beat Nashville and we beat Carolina. As much as I'll probably kick myself because of the matinee game and we tend to lose those, I'm going to go with the four points for this week. Uh-huh. So I think if we don't get at least four, um, the Flames have to hang the for sale sign out as soon as they get home. Yeah. And realistically, if they only get four or less, like they're going to need to make up those points very quickly. If they're because, like, once they hit the 29th of March, when that's that final six game stretch against LA, San Jose, and Anaheim, like they need to be in a playoff spot by then. And if because if they're not, like, they're not going to make the playoffs. No, that'll be, uh, you know... That's Murder's Row, you know. like it, that, It's Murder's Row, and those teams will probably be putting their B players out too, but even their B players, you know, aren't pushovers. Yeah. It's where you generally start to shut down your stars at that point if you're making the playoffs. But, yeah, I really think that the, the end of this month is really going to be important for the Flames because it tells us if we're either buying or selling. You know, we've got Nashville, Tampa Bay, Florida, Carolina... LA Kings were back on the 28th and that's the day right before the trade deadline. And then again, on the third, we play against Detroit. And I really think that there's, I don't know. I just think that you need to make that decision soon. We've already seen them bring in Michael stone today. Um, I wouldn't say that was necessarily a seller's deal. I think that's just a good hockey move, but we're starting to see these guys making deals. And I think really, really, I'd say by almost the end of the Florida game, you got to decide if you're buying or selling so you can get a jump on the deadline. Yeah, like, I think the stone trade was just a smart hockey trade. Yeah. Because you're you're going to likely keep him regardless. So, you know, like, that's not a move for just the next handful of games and then let him go. It's No, it's not a rental. So, I think... But at the same time, we can't do a lot more deals and give away nothing either. So, we have to start deciding, I think, if we're going to give up assets or acquire assets. Yeah. Um, But it'll be interesting this week. So, enjoy the week of of away hockey and be ready, everybody, on the 28th to get in the dome and get loud when the Flames come back. Yeah. Now, I have one question before we go. Sure. What do you think the odds are that we see number 12 on the ice for Calgary once again? Jerome McGinley? Yeah. I've been thinking about that over the last couple weeks. I think that's going to depend if the Flames are in a playoff spot or not. I think Iggy's going to move. Well, I'm certain Iggy's going to move. I think he's going to move somewhere that's a playoffs destination. I don't want to give up an asset for Iggy I want to give up a draft pick or some condition for him. I just, he's, he is a rental. He's not coming back next year. Would you agree? He might, but he, he wouldn't be a $6 million or five and a half or whatever he's making player. But even then I'd rather just sign him as a UFA at that point. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, so I think for this year, he's not, I mean, we don't need him as a rental. I don't think he's going to help the team that much. If he is a rental, I'm hoping we could give up a, you know, either a draft pick low, like six, seven form or some farm guy that is in the age is in the ECHL or something. But I just, I've just been trying to think, what do we give up to Colorado to get him? And I can't come up with a package. that's not going to hurt. Yeah. To bring in what is essentially nostalgia act. 
Yeah. Jerome's not coming in, and tell me if you disagree, Matt. He's not coming in, and he's not going to be a top six. I think he'd be like a third line guy, at basically replacing Chase Sloan. And yeah, I agree. then you just stick him on the first power play unit and have Gaudreau feed him pucks for one dimers. I mean, if you could trade Chase on for him, I wouldn't be too worried about that, but I don't see Colorado wanting Chase on. Yeah. Well, like if Unless... you could give him like Kulak or Yoki Paka or Chase on, like uh, just a filler bottom end of the lineup type guy. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I could see is if Jerome really wants to come back here and if he talks to. Sackick over there and says, look, I really want to go to Calgary and Sackick and Trillivan work it out that, you know, what we'll just do Iggy for chase on both of their contracts expire at the end of the year. We can essentially re-sign them back at the end or whatever you might want to do. Um, that's the only thing I could see working out is if it's sort of this symbolic, you know, filler for filler. Yeah. But I just, I don't, and I've been trying to think what would a reasonable package look like? And the fact we just gave up a third and a fifth, we don't want to give up all our draft picks either. And if I have a draft pick to give up, I'm not sure I want to give it up for Jerome anymore. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know what the reasonable package looks like besides say a chase on or a, the only thing before you asked me this, when I've been thinking about this over the last week, what I thought would be a fair trade would be Boma for Iggy and a pick. Yeah. Uh, Cause I, I think that, that yeah. I think that they could use Boma next year. Like he would fit in that roster. Well, he knows some of the guys there, like Colborn. Um, and I would want to pick back because he, I mean, Boma is an asset. Yeah, so like I say would, a Ginla in a seventh or something like that. Well, I would almost do Iggy in a fourth um, yeah. because I think that's what Boma is worth on the open market. And you just kind of say, you know what, give us a Ginla as a freebie, essentially. Yeah. He wants to come back here. So that was kind of where my mind was going. Yeah, I could see something along those lines. And while we're talking about Aginla, we should also note the uh, retirement this week. Former Calgary Flame Alex Tange announced his retirement. I didn't even know this guy was not retired yet. I kind of lost track of him. Yeah, well, he didn't play at all this season. and Well, that's it. I just kind of assumed he'd already retired. but Yeah. Um, so, you know, good for Tange. He's had a couple runs here and looked good when he was put with the right players. But overall, I think he was given a bigger role than he should have been here. And uh, hopefully he'll, you know, find something else in hockey after he retires if he wants it. Yep. Maybe we'll hire him and Iggy next year to be our new assistant coaches. Oh, goody. <laughs> Those two and Conroy, we got the whole line. Yeah. There's all our new assistant general managers. Where's McCammon? Bring him in, too. And Hesalius, just bring all those guys back. All right, Matt. Well, yeah, good question. Um, what do you think? What do you think about the drone thing? I think that if the flames want to address the right winger spot without breaking the bank again like i'm not i've never been a a huge fan of again but just for pure asset cost i think that would be the best bargain out there for a legitimate scoring right winger and why not you know and especially with him being a flame for so long it makes some sense so we'll see uh, it all comes down to the acquisition price like if it's not gonna break the bank like if it's say like brett pollock or something like okay sure who cares so we'll see uh, i'm i would hope that they do just for all the excitement that would bring and I yeah, think it would bring it, excitement, but I also think it would bring almost, I don't want to say a nightmare, but it would bring some PR challenges in that now you've got this guy coming back who was a star here, and I think you now have to taper Calgary expectations. Yeah, and that is a drawback, so we'll see. Uh, like, I can understand both sides of the argument there, so, uh, you know, if they can get somebody of a more higher profile like say like a Gabriel Landis cog, then obviously you go that route. I but, just think that the, I think with so few teams selling, the price for Landis cog is going to be astronomical. Oh yeah, but it's one of those situations that is he worth the cost? And like if he's worth a good prospect, a first round pick, and say a, a roster player of some sort, well. Uh, I think that Landis Cog's value is greater than that. So 
sure why not especially with this being such a uh, mediocre draft year uh, that if you're going to do a trade like that, this is a year where it makes sense to do that. And we'll see. And I, if the deal makes sense, like everything, if it makes sense, you'd pull the trigger. If it doesn't, you don't. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I agree with you about what Landon Scott's probably worth. I think he's going to go for a lot more just because there's not a lot of teams selling at the deadline. I think you're going to see an astronomical price paid for him that I don't even want the Flames to be in on. Yeah. Well, like, I could see it being, like, say, like, Jankowski plus Shillington or Anderson and a first-round pick. And do you think, well, is he worth that? And as much as I like Jankowski and Shillington, yeah, I think that is worth that. Yeah, so, he is. So... You got to play all of that logistically. Does it make sense and see how it goes? But you know, it it everything depends, and it'll be fun to see how things shake out over the next couple of weeks. For sure. Well, Matt, let's uh, let's chat next week just before the trade deadline, and we will talk then. We'll have a little bit more discussion around what the Flames maybe have done or what they will do, and that's always my favorite week of the season. It gets sort of monotonous going through such a long season at some point, especially when your team isn't great. And I don't know about you, but I feel that energy picking up again. Yeah, I agree. It'll, right, be buddy, a, we'll, it'll be a fun last 23 games, so let's... I I don't know about that. I think it'll be a fun week, and we'll see what happens after that. If we sell off a lot of pieces, I think it could be a very frustrating last 23 games. True. I think we may end up seeing a lot of guys who come in here and you know are brought up from the farm, and we always see those struggles every year with those players as they're getting ready for the for the um you know the nhl and learning the ropes and but it'll be interesting nonetheless it might not be exciting but it'll be interesting yeah all right buddy we'll, we'll talk to you next week thanks for listening everybody and have a good week this has been another fireside chat don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca follow us on facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat and to follow us on twitter at fireside podcast Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.